You know, Roddy, could you just share a little bit about yourself and I guess everything that you do maybe at a high level and then we can dive into each area of what you're doing specifically by your great activity and running around. Yeah, I'm an ex-international cyclist. So I've raced for Scotland and Great Britain at quite a high level. And then in 10, 10 years ago, um, I lost almost three stone in the space of six weeks. My wife got very concerned about this. So got a self-testing kit for type 1 diabetes. That arrived at the house on the Monday. I did the test. It looked like, yes, she got type 1 diabetes. But I had a dilemma because I had a ticket for the European Cup final down in Manchester to watch Glasgow Rangers play a Russian team. I knew if I went to the doctor, he wouldn't allow me to go to the game on the Wednesday. <laughs> so I made an appointment for the day after, for the Thursday, for my doctor. And... I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes with quite a high blood glucose level that day of 45.6, which someone without type 1 diabetes is between 4 and 7. So they said I was actually quite lucky not to go into diabetic coma. When I was diagnosed, I knew absolutely nothing about the condition. And that really embarrassed me because a person who's raced all over the world for Great Britain and Scotland, and I thought, if I know nothing about the condition, the chances are the majority of folk out there don't know much about the condition so I, I needed to do something to raise awareness so I put in my social media that I was wanting to do a really tough event to raise awareness so my physio who's actually the head physio for the Scottish Institute of Sport said what about the marathon to sub and I'm like well I've heard of that because I've known someone that's done it before and they said that it was that brutal they would only recommend it to people that they absolutely hated so I thought well if he's saying that it must be a really tough event. There was quite a long waiting list to get in. It's normally about three years. So I phoned the organisers at the end of 2012 and told them that I'm an ex-international cyclist diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, wanting to do something to raise awareness. And actually along the way, I raised over £30,000 for Diabetes UK and JDRF UK. The organiser of the Marathon Sabla said to me, give me your email address and we will get back to you within the next couple of weeks. That afternoon, I got an email to say that we managed to get you into the 2013 event. Oh. So I got back to Dave on Twitter, which he replied, you idiot. I was only joking about the marathon of Sabla. Mm -hmm. I was in Sabla as a 156-mile self-sufficient ultramarathon through the Moroccan Sahara Desert. Did you say 157 miles? 154, I think it is. 154 miles. Oh, my gosh. By that point, I went on an insulin pump and managed to get a CGM as well, Dexcom CGM, to help me get through it. So I managed to finish the Marathon Sabla, and since the Marathon Sabla, in 2016, I went and did a 567-kilometer ultramarathon in the Yukon, in the Arctic. So the Marathon Sabla was plus 50 degrees. The ultramarathon that I did in the Arctic was minus 50 degrees. You're self-sufficient, so you tow a pulk, which is a sledge with wheels. And the final 120 miles of the 6633 Arctic Ultramarathon is on the famous frozen Mackenzie River. So it's actually an ice road built on the river. And when the river's frozen, the ice is three metres thick. It's actually on the Dempster Highway. So it's from a place called Eagle Plains to Taktuaktak, uh, which is a hamlet in the in Canada. I was the only person in the race with a two-wheeled pulk and the two-wheeled pulk bobbed and because I had a waist harness the bobbing of the pulk with the, the weight that I was carrying caused me to have severe back trouble. So with 70 miles to go to the finish, about 110 kilometers to the finish line, I had to pull out of the race after having severe hallucinations, absolute crazy hallucinations with sleep deprivation. So when I pulled out I felt I'd let myself down. I felt I let my family down. But more importantly, I felt I let the worldwide diabetes community down. So at the same time of pulling out, I decided, providing I could convince my wife, Lynn, that it was a good idea, I was going to go back in 2017 and try and finish unfinished business. So in yeah. March the 10th, 2017, I'm back in the start line of this 567-kilometer race, determined that I was going to finish it. And I actually finished it in second place. Oh my gosh. I'm the first Scotsman to have finished it. And I've got the sixth fastest time in the history of the race. So I did 
567 kilometers with a total of 18 hours sleep. And no, no hallucinations that time, huh? I didn't hallucinate till three miles to the finish line. And I think the reason is, I, I finished the race at 28, 28 minutes past eight in the morning. With 15 miles to go, I could see the street lights of the hamlet of Tuck lighting up the sky. And when I seen the lights, I said, you dancer, I've finally done it. <laughs> now your brain is a very, very strong tool. And because I told myself with 15 miles to go, that I'd done it, I let all my defences down. So when I got to five kilometres to go, three miles to go, the snow banks at the side of the road started to look like people putting their hands out begging. And there was also a massive hole in the road to my left-hand side that if I was to slow down, I'd fall into this hole. So I decided to listen to my body rather than what I did in 2016. I stopped, went into my pulp, got my flasks out, got my energy drink out. By the time I put my energy drink back in, the pulk and put my harness back on, the hole in the road had gone and the snowbank was back to being a snowbank. That was the only hallucination I had throughout the 2017 race. Wow. And were, were uh, those hallucinations just due to lack of sleep or was it because of uh, low blood glucose? Uh, no, I, that was one of my biggest fears. I had to run my blood glucose level just that wee bit higher because if you had a hypo, and throw hallucinations into the melting pot, that is a dangerous combination. Yeah. So I just ran my blood a wee bit higher than I like to, to avoid going into hypo. Right. The only real issue I had with my diabetes throughout the race was with about 300 kilometres, maybe just slightly less than 300 kilometres to go, my phone packed in, so I had no CGM for the final. Oh, man. So what I was having to do was, because it's minus 50, I was having to take three pairs of gloves off. First time I did it, I put a test strip into my one-touch meter. The meter set came up and it said that the, the test strip was too cold to read. So what I was having to do was get my little tube of test strips and put them down my private parts for 20 minutes <laughs> before they would <laughs> so that they could get to the right temperature so I could find out if my blood glucose level was at a safe for me to continue in the race. What else happened? When I went to redo my insulin and my pump, the insulin had completely frozen, so I had to get my mm. flask out, defrost my insulin so that I could uh, put fresh insulin in my pump. And the other thing for doing the test strips was you're taking three pairs of gloves off and you've only got a window, a short window, before your fingers start getting so cold that you won't get blood out. So I was having to do blood tests so quick. But I'm finished and I'm still alive and I'm still here, so... It's yeah, good. that's incredible. And so, which one was more difficult? It sounds like the colder climate was a more difficult race. The 6633 Arctic made the Marathon Sabla look like a park run. It was just, yeah, it's just so brutal. An absolute beast of a race. It's a, uh, but I've I finally cracked it, so I'm, I'm happy. And how do you, how do you train for something like that? Is it like you, you, you get a sled and you head, you head outside? You've just got to do a lot of back-to-back -back training sessions where you're going out and doing 50-mile back-to-back days, just massive big days out training um, just to get your body used to doing big, big days. Now, for the Marathon Sabla, you can acclimatise for the heat, but you can't acclimatise for the cold. So right. there wasn't any point in me going to a cold climate to train because you, you can't acclimatise right. your body, whereas for the heat, you can acclimatise your body. I mean, those are both incredible accomplishments, and, and it's in, it's incredible just to hear the fact that you went back. I had to. Yeah, you know, I yeah, I understand that. You, you gotta you gotta do it. You set yourself out to do. What what are you gonna do next? I mean, is there anything else you can do that you haven't accomplished already? I don't know. I hadn't totally ruled back going back to the Arctic to try and win it. I also would be very disappointed if I went back and I didn't finish, if I didn't win it because I've already finished second. So I don't know what what's in the future. I go into a lot of schools and do a presentations on what I've done and what can be achieved living with type one diabetes. And then uh, you mentioned you did cycling early on in your uh, athletic and professional career. Is that something you? You still do it to any degree, or is it really just racing and marathons and ultra marathons? I've got my oldest boy, Alistair. Um, I quite often take him out for a, a, a bike ride. So I still got my finger in it. But I mean, we've got a cycle shop in Inverness, 
which will be 30 years open this year. So I've, I still communicate a lot with the people that still cyclists because they come into our shop all the time. Because, I mean, that was something you were obviously really good at. And, and, then, and then you switched over to the ultra marathons. Yeah, what was the reason for that? Was there one? Because in, in 1996, I got to the highest I was ever going to get to in cycling. And I realized that I wasn't, yeah. I couldn't get any higher. So I decided to retire. And that's when I took up a running. And then 10 years ago, the diagnosis with the type 1 diabetes. I mean, I've done I've done a few marathons before being diagnosed. I did London Marathon in 2 hours 44, which is, is okay. So it's not a bad time. What was that? What was life like you growing up? Uh, I was brought up in a farm. My dad he was a shepherd in a farm. So a uh, great years, fresh air, a beautiful part of the world. And living where I live, it, I mean, it's an absolute stunning part of the world we've got i've got loch ness seven miles from my house so i can i can do a 15 mile run from my house and not touch tar once all off road with absolute stunning views it's i i personally i've raced all over the world but i could not live anywhere other than where i live because it is so beautiful and mm. there's never a day i take it for granted what we've got on our doorstep yeah i've been up there before i was in edinburgh oh yeah but we didn't we didn't get to uh, the countryside outside of some of the, the beautiful links golf courses close to Edinburgh. But I can only imagine it's such a beautiful landscape up there. People are amazing. Yeah, and we we've got the Loch Ness monster. We've got Nessie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. 